here this evening to take part in our continuing series of the E-Fall RAW lecture opportunities that we provide at Salisbury State through the School of Education and Professional Studies. We're extremely delighted to have our speaker for the evening, Dr. Mary Bud Rowe, to speak to us about science education and to introduce her. I would like to introduce now Dr. Lee Garigliano. Thank you. Almost 30 years ago, Dr. Mary Bud Rowe came to Teachers College, Columbia University, as a professor and coordinator of the Science Curriculum Improvement Study Trial Center. Being a new professor, she was assigned several students previously advised by senior professors or the chair of the department. I was one of those students. Two of us present in this room tonight became doctoral candidates with Dr. Rowe as their thesis advisor, and she served on the doctoral committee of a third person here this evening. We were fortunate to have had the opportunity of working with her. Our preparation was outstanding. Dr. Rowe's work has also had influence on every person in this room. How many teachers in this country, regardless of the subject they teach, haven't heard and used wait time? If you watch Reading Rainbow, 321 Contact, or The Voyage of Mimi, you might be interested to know that Dr. Rowe has served on their advisory boards. For science educators, she produced the first science helper CD-ROM that makes available in one place hundreds of lessons and activities from programs like ESS, SCIS, and Science of Process Approach. She curr she's currently involved in the process of preparing another science helper to a CD-ROM currently, excuse me, a CD-ROM from programs that integrate the social studies and the sciences for grades six through nine. These are just a few of the reasons why, when we were asked to recommend speakers for these lecture series, that the only name I ever submitted was Dr. Rose. It's particularly fitting that we have a speaker whose background is science education. The renewed criticism of science education in America is causing more interest and development of new curricula. Dr. Rowe was involved in several of those projects. Among her many accomplishments, her secretary had both a long list and a short list to share with me when I called, was her election to the National Academy of Education in 1991. Membership in this academy, limited to 75 individuals, presupposes extensive accomplishments in the field of education. Although it is expected that my role is to list all of the honors and awards a speaker has, we really came here to hear her. And I also recall, in a course that we took together one time, that she said that what the person delivers is really what's most important. Knowing that she can make that delivery is a ple pleasure, privilege, and honor to present to you our 1993 Royal Lecturer, Dr. Mary Bud Rowe. Colleague, colleague, researcher, and above, above all, as she'd like to be known, teacher. Thank you. Good evening. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to be here this evening, and I hope it will be something of a pleasure for you as well. I understand that a, a number of you are required to be here. So <laughs> perhaps you can still have a good time. At least I hope so. I can remember the first time I had to give a presentation when my advisor from Stanford, where I got my doctorate, uh, was in the audience the first time he was in the audience. And I did think I'd throw up. <laughs> and now I find maybe it's worse to have in the audience your former doctoral students. <laughs> So I, I would like to introduce the two doctors, Lawler, back there, who, uh, who uh, managed to get married. They didn't know each other until we came together at, at Columbia University. So uh, uh, it's been a long association and a very good and self-corrective for me from time to time to get feedback from them. Perhaps we'll get some feedback from you tonight. Um, I'd like some information from you first. How many of you are students here at the college? All right. I better ask, how many of you are not students here from the college? All right. How many of you are parents? Okay. Are there any of you who are grandparents? All right, we've got some of them. Okay. How many of you are older than 37 years of age? <laughs> All right. 
you're going to find that's interesting later tonight. <laughs> what I hope to do is, uh, is uh, talk about a little bit something called fate control, F-A-T-E control, and, uh, and engage you at some point in an experiment, which you will actually do with a partner. So you'll need a, uh, a partner. You might just as well decide who your partner is, make sure you've got pairs, so we won't have to worry about that in the middle of the speech. <laughs> You're going to get to know your partner pretty well before the evening's over. <laughs> All right. going to be talking about and inviting you into thinking about uh, tonight, especially those of you who either are parents or who are uh, going to be teachers or are teachers. And uh, uh, fake control is, uh, is uh, uh, an acronym, a short name, to describe a set of attitudes, a set of outlooks that uh, uh, people have. And in a way, for convenience, we can describe the a continuum up along here from this side of the fake control continuum where it's what I call the craps model of the world. The world's a great big game of chance. It's luck that runs it, and how things turn out is pretty much a matter of luck. That's deep in the belief of, of many people. Uh, on the other end, uh, the metaphor that seems useful to describe the other end of this continuum, the sort of higher fake control orientation, is that the world's a bit more like bowling. A uh, bowler knows that you don't get all the pins in every throw. There's uncertainty, but the bowler is persuaded that by studying the situation, uh, he or she can up the score in his or her own favor. So that's a fairly short um, characterization of these two somewhat contrasting views of uh, models of the world that we form as young people and uh, which uh, stay with us. It's not genetic, it's something that happens in the culture and stays with us and gets modified over time. And there's a feeling that what's happening in our society today is helping to drive the whole culture toward the craps model of the world. Uh, so we're really interested in examining importance of that or the relevance of that to, uh, to trying to make a democracy work, to trying to survive with some modicum of happiness. So, and that's in the larger context. Now to begin, let me uh, just put us in some historical context and to get two concepts straightened out in, in our heads to begin with. Uh, the two notions that I want to separate are pubescence and adolescence. Pubescence being a biological process, which most of you know something about, not only because you've been through it, uh, but you, if you are teaching, you know what it's like to endure it with <laughs> its onset with uh, young people. Adolescence is a, uh, uh, begins with the onset of pubescence, and we say that it ends when you are fully absorbed in whatever culture you're living in, in all of the rights and responsibilities of an adult in that culture. So one is a social process, the other is a biological process. That biological process not only changes your uh, uh, procreation capability, but it also, uh, it also changes the nature of the computer that sits in the skull. And we'll be talking about that a little bit and you'll actually get to see a little bit of indication of how your own computers are working there. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, back in biblical and pre-biblical times, there really wasn't any, any adolescent time. The onset of pubescence was uh, very, very late, uh, between 18 and 20 years of age. And life is, was pretty well done for most people, for females by age 29, and for males maybe to 34, 35, 36. It's partly why I asked how many of you, whatever you were going to do in life, you had to get done pretty, pretty fast. Uh, everybody was totally absorbed, working, and, um, and we had more of a surf situation, and food 
was for the food was not a, an easily accessible uh, situation. And as you perhaps know, uh, one effect of improved nutrition is to move the age of onset of pubescence down. If we come uh, gradually over hundreds of years down into the Industrial Revolution period and all the way up to this interval where we are now, we are, you are out of the Industrial Revolution and into what's called the Technotronic um, Revolution. You're into the next revolution in which even more changes that occ than occurred here in 200 years, more dramatic changes will happen in this next 50, 60 years. This is uh, the case now in the Industrial Revolution, and in, which extended well into this century. The onset, the age of onset of pubescence has moved progressively downward. At the same time, the appearance of the adolescent phenomenon, the holding out of people for apprenticeships, for schooling, from full rights and uh, participation in the society uh, appears. And as you come down through the industrial period, the pubescence continues to migrate downward in the period of adolescence, the holding out time, which may extend into colleges these days, um, is, uh, extends out. If you come into the period now, the technotronic revolution, in which we are certainly the transitional folks. In the United States, the onset of pubescence, age, has moved down, so that in this country now, we're coming up on 10 years, 11 months as the onset for females, and 11 years, three months as the average age of onset, average age of onset for males. Now, what grade are you in, in ten, when you're 10 and 11 years old? How much? Okay, fifth grade. A few might be in fourth. Okay. Now, when I say average, you remember any average has variance around it. We have had, for example, at the medical school, at the medical facility at the University of Florida, and this is true in many places around the country, we have had infants born to nine-year-old girls. That's uh, not all that uncommon. We had uh, so many children born uh, to very young adolescents, meaning that the children are often not fully um, the, the infants themselves are often not fully mature, and the youngsters who, what we would have called youngsters, bearing the children, um, are not able to supply all that those infants need. So the intensive care units uh, at, for, for, uh, for infants in many of the major research hospitals have uh, tripled and quadrupled in recent years. If we add to this uh, the increase in the use of um, of drugs, with the consequent impact on the uh, on the kids, the infants. Uh, we run in, for example, at the University of Florida. We have children, infants born, who must stay in the intensive care unit, sometimes up to a year, and we have rotations of students uh, around the clock who come in to handle and hold these infants, so that that very important bonding and that very important uh, motor development will not be totally um, removed from them. So we, we have uh, an effect here of uh, two, two things. On the one hand, we're having uh, more and more high-risk infants born, partly because of the increase in drugs and partly because of the earlier age of childbearing and nutritional uh, difficulties. And the uh, Surgeon General says that we're having uh, an epidemic of adolescent um, births, pregnancy, adolescent pregnancy. On the other hand, this, uh, the, the amount of time that people are staying out of the total workforce, that is when they're not forced to by the economic situation, the training time stretches out more and more in this tech technotronic era. And in fact, I've made this a dotted line to indicate that for some of us it probably has an indefinite upward bound <laughs> Those are the ones that go on to be doctorates and all that kind of thing. Um, but at any rate, if this is the context in which uh, we're, we're uh, operating uh, today. And um, when, 
we look at what happens in this adolescent time driven by the newly uh, changing hormone pattern and the newly changing computer that's coming on board in people's heads, um, any of you who've worked with young adolescents know that this is a bit how we might characterize them. They're impatient. Um, they want answers now. They want action now. They thrive on action. Sitting still, as long as you're sitting still now, is pretty hard. Looks from the look of some of you aren't quite out of this period yet. Um, they like, uh, they uh, like action, and people, they cathect or get attracted to causes very easily. As a matter of fact, the shock troops of most terrorist movements around the world are made up of youngsters from 10 to 19 years of age. So they are a real force that people who are trying to produce political uh, change in violent ways, uh, they are a force uh, for attraction. And in, uh, in many of the gangs, the organized gangs in cities, you'll find uh, a whole set of young apprentices learning uh, the, uh, the gang hunt uh, routines, for example. So there is this business of what do these things offer them? They offer them uh, a cause. They offer them a sense of doing something. And, uh, and we have to find other ways to attract and marshal that energy for many of the youngsters. Now, what's happening to them at this time is they're forming their ideas of the world, uh, their fate control orientation. And uh, from studies of young adolescents all around the world, you find out that this is the list of questions that are on their mind. There's one more I'll show you at the bottom of the list, and perhaps you can guess what it might be. Can you read that? Can you see that? They, wanna, they don't really know what's worth doing. Um, today, there are fewer adults that they can talk with. There are a lot of things that are happening in the world around them that drives them to the craps model of the world. <coughs> they don't know what the competition is. And now, with the business world sort of going, going down, uh, many of them in the high schools and even some of the college kids say, what's the use? Um, you know, people have access to so much more information uh, than they once once did through the through the media, through conversation. One of the uh, the beliefs that we have is that the fake control model, whatever model of the world you're going to have, gets compounded out of the way you develop answers. These children, these grown-ups, these young adolescents answer these questions, and the way in which we keep answering them to ourselves over the span of our, our lives, the way in which we cope with the changes that are going on, uh, the sense of helplessness that sometimes happens. And maybe the last question, which is a very important question that's been left off, uh, that appears in a variety of cultures, who cares? Should I care? Do I care? Why should I care? And I thought uh, Charlie Brown shows us this a little bit better. And we do that with some degree of humor, but you know it's telling you a very important message because what are the answers to caring. And recently, there came a second Peanuts cartoon. And you see that also increases anime. It increases our separation from each other, where we're not even willing to take pleasure or be sad with the, uh, with the events of our friends. So this whole business of uh, what fate control orientation, what craps model, uh, what the model is that we form is really important. And we can characterize there are all, all sorts of gradations between these. Um, 
But one characteristic, this by the way is not an IQ thing. You can take two people of comparable IQ, whatever, one of whom has a Craps model of the world and the other who is predominantly Bowler's model of the world, and they do the world very, very differently. For example, uh, lots of times in school you say to uh, youngsters, you know, do this, you're going to be sorry if you don't because you need it in sixth grade or you need it in high school or you can't get into college, all that sort of futurist promise of payoff for doing something now. Now, high fake control people, the bowlers, are, tend to believe you. They can be sort of suckered into that view, if you will. Not the crafts model, not the crafts model world. They think you're really lucky if you can figure out what's going to happen tomorrow say nothing of next week, to say nothing of next year. So what rewards these two are quite different. This is a here and now orientation, because that's all you believe in. In adults, you often see it as the dollar goes down, we better spend now because heaven knows whether it'll be up there. There are a lot of ways in which these two kinds of uh, people do the world uh, differently. Um, we're not talking exactly about values in terms of uh, honesty or anything of that sort. Both kinds will commit crimes, but they get into jail for different kinds of crimes. Uh, the craps model of the, pe of the world, people, if they get into jail, if they do a crime, usually are crimes of the moment. They require very little planning. But then the high fake control people do the kinds of crimes that gets them into the white collar jails and lampo places like that. Uh, they're what we call the second story men, in the, uh, whereas the craps model are first story break the window. Uh, that is, in any of these cases, this side is, tends to be a little bit more future oriented, tends to do planning, uh, tends to be persistent, uh, task persistent, uh, whereas this, if you have them in class, will often not give you a lot of trouble because they're passive. Uh, very often passive, but you may, some of you now who've been teaching may find that you have youngsters <laughs> who uh, you give them a direction, they'll do it, and then uh, they'll stop a little bit and wait, sit waiting for you to come and tell them what to do next. So the whole business of self-directedness with planning and purpose is something that they have to be helped to get. You can see why the elementary world is so important in the way in which we uh, start to help youngsters form a fake control orientation. Now, there are a lot of things that are happening out there right now that uh, tend to drive us, all, particularly as uh, teachers, into what I call the craps model of the world, and, that, and the children as well. And that has to do with what's happening in testing in the country. The world's gone absolutely insane on, on uh, testing. The curriculum development process, which used to be a fairly sensible planning and uh, identification of major patterns and ideas and developing curriculum around it, went out the window in favor of a political process where groups of folks got together and brought along lists of their favorite objectives and favorite content in each field. And I, as I said this afternoon, I, I saw a list for chemistry uh, for the state of Florida where you unfolded the paper and it went to the floor like this. It had a thousand objectives. This is a one-year chemistry course. The textbook people go around, go around the country, went around the country, the publishers, and collect all these lists, right? And then they, nice thanks to computers, they compile them. And then they say to the authors, get one of these, one of each of these in the, in the book. So, uh, what the nice thing about that is then the book will sell to anybody. And nobody tells teachers you don't use the textbook anymore the way you used to use it because it's not really meant to be read. It's well characterized. The books now weigh a pound and a half to two pounds more than they did just eight or ten years ago. Well, one of the things, an anecdote I like to tell is one youngster picked up, very insightful ninth grader, picked up his... Uh, book which will remain unnamed, slammed it down as science book, which by the way was this thick. Same thing's happening in the college market, by the way. And he slammed it down and said, you know what this is? This is his language, not mine. This is a goddamn dictionary. And who reads dictionaries? When you piece things together like that, they lose the pattern, they lose the connectedness. 
they lose the most powerful part of what for us is science, what for us is powerful in making stories. So here is a case where you, you have source materials that look pretty nice pictures, but are really not readable in the sense of connecting ideas to each other and keeping you engaged. So at the same time, we've got this tremendous testing push. See, all these things are driving teachers into a craps model as world, of the world as well. The testing push is you don't know what's going to get covered in the standard test or the state level test, whatever, the city level test. So everybody is into coverage. But coverage, massive amounts of material, simply doesn't guarantee you're going to get any understanding of anything. And we've interviewed many, many kids who are getting A's in, in high school, and in some cases the college courses, who are getting A's and say, but the minute I don't have to take this anymore, I'm not taking it because I know I don't really understand it and it is boring. It's, uh, so there are a lot of things that are happening that um, convince um, people that we're moving in this craps model of the world, in which I think we need to work uphill against. Now, the uh, craps model of the world, the bowler's model of the world, deal with problems in very different ways. For example, suppose they're both um, ill in a hospital. Now, some medical people who are into what I call the witch doctor model of medicine really prefer the craps model person to the bowler, because the craps model person will tend to be passive and will do without questioning or challenging what you, uh, what you as a physician tell them. But the bowler, if, if you're going to get a new medicine or new treatment, the bowler says, well, what is that? How do you know it works? What's the risk? What do I have to do to get out of here? The bowler is much more in the mode of taking charge, uh, running uh, the life, the, con the uh, contextual things around their lives, taking some hand in in the way it goes. And that's very hard for some medical people. But increasingly, having people take more charge of the direction their lives are going is going to be uh, an increasingly Im important thing as the life uh, around us gets more complex. And lest you think it isn't getting complex in every way, some of which are sort of fun, I thought we might look in this how many of you have taken some science courses? How many of you? <laughs> and how many of you learned about hypothesis testing and forming problems and all that stuff? Well, I thought you might like to see. Here's the description of the old scientific method. Right? OK. Now, here's a description of the new scientific method. The world is changing. The business world is changing. Relative values out there around us are changing. And you couldn't even get basic science on the edge of this chart. It's so small. So we're very heavily into a big marketing sort of uh, situation. Now, all these nice inventions that we have create lots of social stress for us and, and various kinds of knowledges we never would have had to have a few years ago. Okay. You see, uh, the sources of frustration begin to change. Many times they become more numerous. And of course, you really need to do something about uh, new kinds of figuring of, of, uh, and using numbers, planning your agenda and your travel. And since we've got so much more sophisticated in our science and in our technology, trying to uh, make the world work better for all of us, 
uh, we get ourselves into some fairly complex sort of situations. Can you read that in the back? The first one says, maybe if we filter the water through this cloth. Nope, still salty. It goes down to the middle. Well, how about they do something? The apparatus gets more and more complicated. Finally, he says, well, not bad. Now let's build one to get rid of the detergents. Uh, things do increase in their complexity around us. The kinds of aptitudes and tolerances we have to have to stay flexible change. And of course, as things get more complex from the government, <laughs> your excuses just won't do. So what is it like keeping, uh, a, developing a bowler's model in the world today? Is a, a, and keeping it is a little bit hard. Uh, now there's one advantage to the crafts model of the world as compared to the bowler's model of the world. Uh, crafts model of the world have no fault insurance. <laughs> that is, since they're not responsible for how things turn out, good or bad, then, uh, then they're not responsible for anything. So you've got some very interesting uh, issues about, um, about values, about actions that people take, about responsibility people feel or don't feel for each other. And uh, that's interesting, given all of the current press with, uh, with cooperative learning, those sorts of uh, ventures. Um, you have to look and see if you can um, hook the uh, low fake control people, or if it's going to keep some people from sliding into a low fake control orientation. Life is getting fairly complex, and we do need each other, learning to use each other's resources and, uh, and uh, not to put each other down. Now, that's a really interesting thing when you get to the college level, because part of your success in being able to go on, say, to get into med school is to beat the other fellow. Don't help anybody else which is great stuff when you become a doctor after a while. The, uh, um, we've actually seen uh, college students wreck ex experiments of other kids uh, in order to, uh, to uh, beat the competition. In it. So there are some really important things that are happening that are very hard for, uh, and even more competitive for young people today than they were for some of us who are a bit older. Now, one of the effects, why? Why should we fuss so about <coughs> what's happening in the testing, what's happening to our approach to content? Well, one reason is people hate it more. It's, uh, we need to do something about it. But it also is changing what people know and understand, you know. And uh, some of you will feel some sympathy for this. Now, how would you like to have some docs like that? <laughs> <laughs> and if you're trying to have a, a conversation with somebody uh, and uh, they're trying to interpret it, <laughs> so context in which the language is used makes a lot of difference, and that's the way some teachers snow kids, keep the keep the. Uh, you know, the status going, if you've got all the secret inner words. Now, there's a, another uh, matter. Those things are a little bit humorous, but they're very frustrating in many ways. And we've had a lot of talk in this developing brain about right brain and left brain, and we've got to work with both sides of our brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So some of these things, you know, we do them, they have a, a humorous touch, but they're really talking about some fairly important underlying uh, values. Now, uh, this whole business of breaking the world into little bits has very serious consequences, uh, for example, for medicine, for the way in which we're doing the college scene, where it's very hard to get people across departments in college to talk to each other in intelligent fashion. And when that extends into something that's important, like medicine, for example, look, any of you have had to deal with specialists. Can you see what, but you want me to read that bottom line? This is, this is a, a lateral view 
in the uh, uterus. And it says, territorial imperatives at work on the pelvic floor. A gynecologist, a urologist, and a colorectal surgeon quarrel with, e with each other while ignoring the common ground in which they all stand. And there are many, many instances we might use of uh, any time you've tried to get some, a general physician, for example, these days, are pretty hard to get one. They're, uh, they're all so specialized, you have to be your own diagnostician. Okay, so breaking the world up is a trend that has to be worked against. <coughs> Working towards synthesis, putting things together, starting to build new gestalts. But we aren't a world that's trained for that, and we haven't trained for it very well in the sciences either. We've tended to be fairly analytic. But the attempt to think system-wise and start to put things together across boundaries is, is turning out to be very productive in some fields, and the job market is really great if you're interested in something like biotechnology, where they are having to build, that's going to be a hot business thing for quite a long time, and the difficulty is nobody was really trained for it in the beginning. You've got to have a good wedding of biology and, and uh, physics and chemistry and uh, material science and a whole bunch of things that we, and you'll start to see ads like for designer genes. <laughs> Uh, a whole different way of approaching things. Now this complication can kind of, at face value, scare people off. You know, the whole world in, post, in, in little pieces. Every day you wake up, uh, it's, uh, there's a new thing that if you eat it, it's going to make you sick um, or going to make you too fat. And after a while, when you're bombarded with a lot of stuff and you don't have a framework for taking it in, you say, oh heck. I mean, no matter what I do, it's going to do me in, so I'll do it. And you get that happening in a lot of dimensions other than just food. Um, and when people get frustrated, then they sometimes get violent, or they'll get extreme in their behavior. So the whole business is, what do we do to help us all um, stay in the game, be reasonably, maintain some reasonable degree of flexibility? And um, I'm going to talk, tell you about some things and have you try an experiment that will illustrate others. Um, this is some work we've been doing which really says, well, what should an instructional, what should the instruction or the experience be like? Uh, we've tended, especially with this uh, testing thing, is what do people know? And to ask that in a fairly shallow way. But we haven't done a lot with... Uh, challenging either as parents or uh, as teachers with children. Uh, why do we believe what we believe? Where do we get it? Uh, what is it that's uh, valuable in it? And uh, what is the evidence that supports your, your view? We do, a, we've, we do a lot with that first thing. What do we know? We do a lot of jamming knowing down. But the business of starting to evaluate the knowing and the sources of information that end up producing the knowing, we don't do so much about. And this is the box that the kids call. We do this with the uh, youngsters. This is the box the youngsters call the so what box. If you cannot help them answer the so what of uh, something you're doing, then I think we have, a, we have a problem. They need to make connections. And so uh, what, are you, what are you making out of this, and what can you do with what you know? And this whole business of imagining multiple things that you can do and starting to think about consequences. Now, consequences means thinking more than one day ahead, trying to develop some sense that you can do some planning that will make a difference, first in little bits and then in bigger bits, and looking at why you should care with any particular piece of thing. If you're doing something in environmental science, um, you're trying to bring together materials from many sources, but not do the problem solving for kids. Help them develop some questions and work around a cycle like this. Sometimes they come into this cycle through, and this is true for the college students, through something that's happened in the outer world. So there's not a necessarily a particular order that you go through here, but if you don't, we think that if you go through a cycle like this, in whatever field you're teaching, 
for about at least four times in a year, three to four times in a year, you make a stab at doing something on this high fate control. Now the other thing that's a bit problematic for us is that youngsters haven't got anybody, any adult to talk to. If people said to me, as somebody on Clinton's staff did a week or two if, ago, if there were one or two things you could do to help change things around in this country, what would they be? And one of them, I thought, was you have to get lots of adults of all kinds available to and talking with young people, young adolescents. What's happened in the country is, with classes getting bigger, the drive for coverage getting more, and this, by the way, is as true for college, college people. They haven't got anybody, really, other than each other to rap, to rap with. So it's hearing, not being told, but hearing, and bouncing their ideas off of people who are maybe half a generation to two or three generations ahead of them in time. She's, Margaret Mead said, you know, the family today is an institution that closes its doors at 8 o'clock in the morning, opens them again at 5 or 6 in the evening, and is being run by one or two tired adults. There is less and less opportunity for young people of all ages to rap with adults, to learn something from uh, other people. You don't get that in lecture, you get some, but you don't have it if you don't have this chance to talk. And maybe the anecdote I use uh, about this, because you in relationship to younger children can certainly provide that help, but many of you at college level need that access as well uh, to other people. At the uh, University of Florida, we have a, a, a big Christmas dinner with faculty and students, and there are usually eight or 10 students and a faculty member. And at some point, uh, I was visiting with a young couple who were uh, seniors and thinking about what they were gonna do with their lives. And when we got the end of the dinner, they said, could we come by your office and visit some more? And I said, not thinkingly, well, of course, you're welcome, but there is a counseling office uh, over across campus who know a lot more about this than I do. And the, the uh, boy, or young man, looked at me and he, he just looked like he'd been hit in the stomach. He said, but those are people who are paid to talk to us. We thought you liked talking to us. So there's the whole business of how to have conversations with people and how to run discourse in a classroom where you can have conversations with people and how to encourage conversations across age levels. And that's one place in which the wait time has turned out to be uh, quite useful. Now, I understand most of you are pretty familiar with wait time. So I thought, and instead of giving you a lot of details about it, I would, we would run an experiment in which you would see uh, the <coughs> physiological, a little bit of evidence of the physiological underpinning about why wait time works as it does. And remember, part of that Teachers around the world, and it turns out parents ask questions and tend to wait one second or less for youngsters to begin answers. And they, as soon as they get any kind of an answer, they tend to jump back in with something else in nine tenths of a second. Now, if you increase the pauses at these two locations after you've asked a question, and particularly after a youngster makes a response uh, by youngster. That's anybody 24 years of age or younger um, makes a response. You're going to get considerable changes in the language output. And as a teacher, I think of us as physicians who can only do good diagnosis and careful if we can hear what's in people's heads. If we are members of a college faculty, we have to hear it from the students. If you're an administrator in a college, you have to hear it from the faculty. It means you have to create an environment in which it is safe to talk and where people do listen to each other. That's going to be the secret of the thing. Now, uh, the, the uh, other feature, which you'll see tonight, because uh, we're going to do an experiment with your partner, 
to understand why. There's also a technique that you've got to put some pressure on your college faculty who lecture uh, to do, and it's called the 10-2, 10-2 treatment. And in that case, and there's a lot of nice research that says if faculty will lecture and limit their lecture bits to eight to 10 minute intervals, and then sets of three students talk over their notes for two minutes. It's not a time you ask the faculty questions, you do that. And then the faculty member goes on, eight to 10 minutes, and there's another two minute talk over. And then the last three, four minutes are reserved for questions. First thing you, we find out is that people's notes are very, very different. There's probably less than 35% overlap in the notes that you take and somebody else takes. So you get some time to fill in your notes to consolidate what's going, uh, what's going on. And what's more, if you then, you know, some people ask questions and they're really doing it in class just to be heard. You've seen some of that. Well, this, is, this means that the kind of questions that get asked at the end are much more productive. Now, having said all of this, why does wait time work? And you're going to see it also works in reading. And that means you need a partner, and uh, you decide. One of your partners is going to be the observer, and the other is doer. Go ahead and decide in your pair who's going to be the observer, who's the doer. Okay. Now, let me tell you, <laughs> let me see the hands of the doers. All right, now you know who's the more risk taker in the pair, right? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now, you uh, observer, you're going to have. To, I'm going to give the doer a task, and you're going to have to. Uh, this will check your observing skills. We want you to observe the pupil of the eye very carefully. Now, the eye may move around. Ignore that for the moment, but observe the pupil of the eye. And you know, your eye, your pupil will dilate in different light things, but your pupil will dilate according to how you're processing some information. Now, it's subtle, you have to watch. So what you might want to do, uh, you uh, observers might want to have your doer put their uh, head up a little bit toward the light in order to shrink down that pupil, because this is a little bit of a dark room, okay? Now, this will challenge your observing skills. Uh, I'm going to give the doer a task. The doers don't have to look at me. You have to face so that your observer can see you. Okay, make sure you can see. Now you see there's a little bit of, uh, often a little bit of uh, humor with this thing. In our culture, we're not, except for reserved people, we don't gaze into each other's eyes, and we don't come that close. And uh, it sets off a whole bunch of uh, warning system, okay? It's very different from culture to culture, what that distance is. All right, now, you doers, uh, leave your face so that your observer can watch. Observer, from the minute I start giving directions, you watch the pupil of that eye until the doers give you an answer to the task they're going to have. Okay? Now, you, you, there are some subtle things here to watch. Okay? Here we go. Doers face your observer. Observer's up to you. Make sure your doers have got them where you want. All right. No pens, no pencils. Here we go. Doers. I am going to give you five double-digit numbers to add. Um, <laughs> okay. you, observers may have already seen the first effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, here's the, here we go. I am going to deliver those questions, uh, those numbers, at the pace that we tend to ask questions in the class. Okay, here we go. 35, 45, 21, 23, 32. When you have an answer, whisper it to your observer. <laughs> okay, no. Observers, tell your doer what you noticed. Did it go? Did it go? Yeah. Did he give you an answer? 
Yeah, oh yeah. How many of you saw a change in the pupil size? Okay. How many of you didn't see a change in the pupil size? All right. Now, how many of, of those that didn't see a change, did the person give you an answer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if the person refuses the task or gives up after it, you may see a small uh, dilation. What, what happens in, in order for you, we ch chose numbers because you wouldn't have a framework for packing them together in some, uh, and unless you're in a very experienced math combination person or something, in which case you'll see a, a totally different strategy. But what, what uh, we believe is that everything all a task like this and most tasks have to be handled using short-term memory. And your short-term memory is like an elevator in a tall building. Where it, up, it takes you up and down in the layers of your brain. And what it does is when you're loading it up, the pupil dilates. Now, the more strange the stuff is to you, the sooner it's going to dilate. Okay? Uh, all right. When when it's fully dilated, you people who do lectures around here, or any of you who are teaching, when it's fully dilated, that means the elevator is loaded. That means anything anybody says to you isn't going to go in. It isn't going to get anywhere, right? Okay? We're using numbers as an example, but this would be true with concepts. Okay? Now, I think it's only fair that we would reverse this process and let the person who was the observer Okay. Now that the other thing you will, uh, at this time, the person who is now the observer will do two things. You will not only watch what happens to the pupil of the eye, but you will, can also watch where the eyes move, if they do. All right? Okay. Now, here we go. Make sure you see the eyes. And doers, you will give your answer. You whisper your answer to your observer. Here we go. 23, 71, 15, 33, 14. dilation that time, okay? How many of you saw none? I want to know, for those of you who saw dilation, pupil dilation, has the pupil closed down? Did you leave the elevator jammed open or has it closed down? <laughs> okay. How many of you had the experience uh, of um, studying a textbook, for example, and at some point noticing that you've turned three or four pages, you feel kind of sleepy, you don't really know what's there? How many of you had that? Okay. All right, okay. Now, exactly the same thing is happening to you. The harder the material is for you, the sooner your pupil will dilate while you're reading. Now, if you've ever tried to read with drops in your eyes, you know that's really difficult. Well, your pupil is dilated. Your, your elevator is stuck on open. <laughs> So any more than lecture won't go anymore, neither will the content. You have to stop, do something with it. We say in the 10-2, 10-2 treatment, talk it over. But if you're doing some reading, stop, think about it a bit, make yourself a little drawing, whatever you want, and then go on. So you chunk it this way. Many of you may have noticed that you took, you when you had a lecture that was right on the edge of your understanding and you took notes, and you get home at night, I certainly have had it, and I thought, who in the world took these notes? <laughs> you know? It's uh, uh, a matter of the notes trying to help enough of a recovery of what managed to get through out of the elevator and into storage up here. Now, when you ask somebody a question, we're really running, I'd run you one more experiment, but we're running a bit out of time. Uh, when you ask somebody, a, a student, 
when you're teaching and you ask a student a question, uh, you'll always see, and I don't say you're supposed to run around and watch, but there'll be a little pupil <laughs> dilation, especially if it's one they have to think about. And you will find that the, uh, the search time to construct an answer, you can monitor it. Uh, in fact, if I would ask you, if we had time, we could do one more quick experiment doing. Okay, go back to the first observer-doer combo. Okay. Now, you observers this time, you really pay attention to eye movement. You'll see some pupil dilation, but it won't happen when you expect it quite. You'll see a little bit. You see, most things you want to observe happen through time, so you want to watch the time changes. All right, here we go. Uh, doer, I'd like you to describe your bedroom in such a way that nobody could possibly mistake it for anybody else's bedroom but yours anywhere in the world. Go ahead and go until I tell you to stop. Observer, tell them what you noticed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Now some of you may have seen some pulsing of the eye. How many of you saw the eye sweep around an area as though they were uh, looking for something. It's sort of an inside picturization. All of these functions happen in different parts of the brain. And now I asked you there, this was a visual question. In other words, it asked you to access a visual image and then find ways to talk about it. But where you talk about things is not where you store the image. So to get the words, you may have seen how many of you saw some side movement of the eye, first up and down, low the image, then go and get the words. Now, youngsters that are, are, uh, are, have a language difficulty, and including blind youngsters that I've worked with at Gallaudet, it, they go through exactly the same process. The pupil dilates. If they have any sort of internal spatial image, the eyes will move in accord with it. So we're really looking at something that has a physiological underpinning. And you can see now why we talk about having wait time, especially wait time two, because as you may have watched this, you say the first thing that comes to your head, first thing the elevator can find, those are not usually the most imaginative answers. Once you start to get elaboration, you have to go find those. There have to be spaces in time for that, uh, for that to happen. And you can see why the 10-2, 10-2 treatment, if you could just uh, encourage your faculty to do that, has really <coughs> beneficial uh, effects. Because as a lecture goes ahead, and there are fewer and fewer uh, times for the elevator to empty itself, after a while, the last 15 minutes, it's well demonstrated of a lecture is out the window. And before I get totally out the window, <laughs> I better be uh, finished here. So uh, I think uh, what I'm after is that we should be working toward all the ways in which we could encourage a relatively high fate control orientation, especially if we want to try to make a, a thing as complex as a democracy work, because it's the hardest and most difficult um, social economic structure to try to run. And I happen to be uh, into that. I happen to think that's what we are about, and that teachers are the social genes for democracy. You are the carriers of that, um, of that whole structure. And if we fail, even though the society doesn't appreciate that, if we fail at whatever level we're teaching, uh, we fail the country. We fail ourselves. 
And I, I like to end with a quotation from Wan Su, the ancient Chinese philosopher, who said, a pheasant has to take 10 steps to get a mouthful of food and 100 steps for a belly full of water. If he were kept in a cage, he would not have to do that. He would, not be, he would be treated like a king. But he would not be happy. Why? Because he would not be free. And it seems to me what we are trying to do is to teach our people and keep teaching ourselves how to live outside a cage with some modicum of success and a reasonable degree of happiness. Thank you very much. Field a few questions. Oh, you can. Your uh, Dr. Rowe will uh, field a few questions. Um, so if any of you have to leave, go ahead, and others may just remain. We also will have um, some refreshments at the end of the hall. We'll never do undergraduates that didn't think refreshments were a good thing. <laughs> Are there some questions? Okay, I'll be around. Uh, did I see one over there? Yeah. We'll wait till okay. some of the people clear. Yeah. We'll have wait time. Yeah. Very, very good. <laughs>